We're, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, luckily, these breakout sessions are about 25 minutes, so if you do have to stand at the back or sit on the floor, it's not too long. Um, I'm, my name is Jennifer Gruy, and I am a, <laughs> like, I'm an assistant professor in the psychology department, as well as I direct um, our first year experience program up on campus called Connections. And I'm here with my colleagues. Um, this is Rose Judd Murray, Assistant Professor in Applied Sciences, Technology, and Education. I'm the Program Leader for Non-Formal and Community-Based Education. And I'm Arlene Graff, and I teach in the Nutrition, Dietetics, and Food Sciences Department as a Professional Practice Associate Professor. And rather than reading a really long little bio on each of us, we thought it would be fun to just share one cool thing about us. Um, I'm a little iffy on yours, if yours is really a cool or scary thing. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I told them earlier, I've been transported to the hospital in an ambulance as the patient. Like, not just for fun, but anyway. <laughs> so you guys can get more details later. I grew up on a cattle ranch, and I have a deep love for Australian cattle dogs. That's interesting. <laughs> and I used to do a lot of traveling before I had a baby in 2019 and then the pandemic hit and one of my favorite memories is kayaking around Greece. It was really fun. So, um, all right, uh, we, this is our, our session, hello. Um, this is our session uh, description that you can definitely read about. Um, to why we decided to pick this particular topic and talk about this particular topic. One thing I want to point out is that as a general education instructor, which I've been for many, many years, um, my students have always kind of struggled with these, sometimes what I view, I know for them it's not basic academic skills. And um, that has always been something that I've been worried about. The last couple of years, uh, I know that me and also my colleagues here have really noticed that our students have struggled more. And we can blame it um, likely on a lot of uh, different things, but the fact of the matter is, is we are trying our best to meet students where they are rather than where we want them to be or we expect them to be um, years ago and prior to the pandemic. So. The, this is just an outline of some of the things that we're going to talk about. Uh, we are all going to highlight some different kind of key things that we have utilized within our own classrooms. Um, one nice thing about, uh, I think, our approach with this particular subject is that these things have been tried and they worked um, within our own classrooms. Now, not to say that it necessarily will transfer really well, but maybe you can adapt something to your own classroom. So I just want to talk a little bit about equality versus equity. Have you heard those two terms? So for some reason, I used to think that they were about the same thing. And then I discovered that actually they're not. So I think we all know that not all students start at the same starting line, meaning that they come into our class with a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different experiences. and so that starting line is a little bit staggered. And so the definition of equality versus equity is that equality means you, you treat all students the same, they get all the same resources and, and help, but equity means that you take into account someone's abilities and circumstances and you make it fair and just, and you make that finish line possible for everyone and your course doable. So we're gonna focus on examples of how we've implemented um, equitable experiences to kind of incorporate academic or teach academic skills uh, with our content. So here's an example from my class. This is a 1000 level gen ed large enrollment course. And what I discovered early on is that students would often have the first exam, they'd struggle and that they'd send me emails about what can I do. And I feel like I said, I, I already told you. <laughs> and, and I was kind of giving the same tips to everyone and it was one-on-one. -on -one. And so what I have been doing for quite a while is I identify students in the class who are doing well. In fact, I think Kristen 
was one of the first people, like way back. He used to be one of my students. <laughs> yeah. So he, so I um, asked him to um, share some study tips. And now I have students do videos, and they're short, like two to four minutes long. And they can choose, you know, how they record their video. But then I post them on Canvas with their permission. And, and then I refer their peers to this page, and it's been highly successful because it's peers teaching peers. And so that's one way. Another thing um, I like to do is skill drills. I like that because it rhymes. But this is a 2000 level course, and it has a, a research writing assignment. And not everyone comes in with the same writing skills. And so what I do is I, I scaffold their writing assignment. And, and when they turn in a draft of one part and it's not so great, then I say, we'll go do one of these skill drills. And so I have five skill drills that um, kind of walk them through the writing process. It's specific to my class. And some students can totally bypass this and do fine on their research paper. But, uh, and, and this is uh, like, this is an optional assignment. So they can choose to do it or not and kind of self-identify if that, that's an area of weakness. And they get um, unlimited attempts, and it's kind of a low-stakes assignment, so they get points if they attempt, and they can do it as many times as they need. But it's it's divided. If you'll go to the next one, like it it gives this little, you know, text of information about whatever the topic is, and then they ha have some questions to answer. Sometimes I put videos here or other resources or link out so that. Uh, they can, it's kind of a, a self-guided teach yourself thing so that you can resubmit that uh, writing piece that you didn't do so, so well on the first time. And the writing part is similar to what the keynote was talking about where, yep, you got this down or you need some work, so go check out a skill drill and it will help you. Yes. You add that into your grading if this is graded for people who do it, but there are people who don't. It's extra credit. Yep. So they can get up to 20 points extra credit, and so each one is worth five points. And so, what, like once they reach the 20 point maximum, then they can't get more than 20 points. But it's like by then they've seen the benefit of learning it anyway. So we're we're taking for granted that the students who don't need to do this won't need extra credit. Sometimes I, I'm just wondering how that like they can, they still can't they still okay. can't. And if they already have these skills, then it's an easy five points okay. for them. And they just have to do it once instead of 10 times. All right. So, thanks, Marlene. Um, so mine, uh, some examples uh, that I want to share with you came out of um, observing my class as well and seeing some different areas in which they struggled. I always feel like teaching these large classes, I don't have enough time to cover the content. I go, <laughs> like, on top of the content, you also want me to teach you how to do proper test taking, time management, um, how to study for the exams. I, I mean, it's just too much. And so I really try to think of ways, okay, I, I don't have additional time in class. How can I um, start to interweave uh, some of these ideas within my content so the students can learn, but they may not, um, but I'm not having to use that in class, that precious in class uh, time that I have. So one example, um, that I want to share with you is an exam wrapper. Um, so my first exam, it's always a good eye opener for students. They go, oh, okay, I need to work a little harder, study a little harder. And um, I definitely have those students that come in and they, they may say, you know, I feel like I did everything right. I don't know what I have to improve on. And so um, one thing I've incorporated the last little while is this idea of an exam wrapper. And I actually worked with a learning specialist on this and we published an article about it. Um, but this what is a way that the students that want to, um, I do have sometimes those A++ students that are like, I'm still gonna do this as well on that one question I met, missed, and that's great. Um, they are able to review their particular, um, the, the items they missed. They have to go through a particular a sheet and identify what they did wrong. They have to um, tell me 
a plan of how they are going to change their behavior. I'm in psychology. I want to see change in behavior moving forward. And then I give them back half credit per item missed. Um, I only let them do it once because I also, as a psychologist, I'm like, you need to learn from your and you get one chance and if you don't if there isn't learning occurring then uh, we're not going to continue doing that um, my next example um, I worked with a so years ago I started working with a learning specialist that helped me identify some specific things that students struggle in in my class I know that um, there is this whole uh, whole array of academic skills out there but there's some particular ones that students just tend to struggle with more so in my class than in other classes after identifying those um, I worked with a colleague in my department who um, specializes in some of these academic strategies and success strategies. Um, and we, uh, Taylor made these particular videos for my class, addressing those uh, particular problems. Now, here's the, here's the difference. The students can engage in some of these. I give them a few points extra credit if they want to do them. It's very low amounts of extra credit. It's, it's like, uh, just a little bit, a little carrot to um, hopefully entice a few to do this. And they have to engage in these particular strategies, these particular academic skills. They watch a video to learn how to do it. And then they have to engage in it with my class material. So they have to review, um, I think the one I have, rewriting notes and studying in smaller chunks. Um, they have to show me that they have done that with our actual class material. So they engage in that, um, they turn it in and they get a few extra credit points, which has been very successful in my class. Oh, we can skip that. Uh, and then I wanted to point this out. Um, we have these available and people may not be. So these videos came out, I think it was about 2020, 2021. Um, the university made a number of videos that are kind of pro tips from some um, uh, faculty across campus that talk about different things so if you don't have access to hey I want to work with a learning specialist and um, and identify those specific things you you for your class you can you can pull from this already ready-made material on these particular um, things that students tend to struggle with okay so last year I was in a ETE learning circle and we looked at this book, iGen, Why Today's Super Connected Kids, blah, 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 blah. Long story short, this is a, an interesting thing because one of the things that I wanted to point out in this session is that uh, if you're a millennial teaching Gen Z or iGen, as Dr. Twenge refers to them, or you're like me, you're a Gen Xer or possibly a boomer generation, these kids are learning in really different ways. And I think. Um, Jessamine this morning did a, a great service by pointing out that they're doing their research by TikTok. I too read that very disturbing article. But uh, <laughs> the, the kicker is they're obsessed with safety. They're fearful of their economic futures. And safety in my generation as a Gen Xer was, you know, be home before people start looking for you. Their definition of safety is, uh, Professor Meekum asked me to talk to the person next to me. This is an unsafe environment. And if you think I'm kidding about that, you are you really ought to take a look at chapter four in this book. Have no patience for inequality based on gender, race, sexual orientation. They're at the forefront of the worst mental health crisis in decades. A lot of that has to do with their feelings of not being safe. And how do I be feel safe? Um, we tend to think of them in high school and as teenagers as having so much going on with their sports and their activities and places they're going to go and things that they're going to do that they maybe don't have time for homework. They complain about homework a lot. Your students will complain about extra work that you're having them do in class, like some of these study skills things. But the truth is, when we run the numbers, they're spending less time on homework, paid work, volunteering, and extracurricular com activities combined than all previous generations, <laughs> not more. So some really interesting things. Um, after graduating um, without introductory management experience, 
a lot of them don't have jobs in high school, so they don't have a lot of multitasking experience. They're not familiar with how to multitask. Um, figuring out how much to spend on movies, gas, meals out, that kind of training. So if you're teaching first year and maybe trickling into second year students, they have a limited experience with managing those kinds of activities. So if they're in your class and they're working a part-time job, managing that time is not something they've probably ever done before. Uh, equate speech with physical violence and safety extends to all emotional safety which is why I said speaking to someone next to them equates to a lack of feeling emotionally safe in your class I don't say this because I think we need to you know throw the baby out with the bathwater and bubble wrap everybody but I think it means that we have to look at what does that equity mean what does that inclusion look like what is that safety look like in your class in terms of helping them incorporate some of these extra things when we ask them to go the distance and perfect their work and listen to the feedback so you don't want to trigger any fe <laughs> additional feelings of emotional safety but maybe working within that realm of in this class we're going to ease into some of these things. We're going to work in groups, and then you're going to work on this. And what does it mean to give good f peer feedback? Those can be really essential elements of this. Uh, that top one, for those of you who are raising teenagers right now and you're wondering, why aren't these people getting their driver's licenses? Why aren't they lined up at the DMV like I threatened? I, yeah, because I, Gen, again, Gen X are here, threatened my own children, said it's time to get a driver's license. They're just not growing up as fast. It's a phenomenon for the generation. It's not that you got bad students in your class or they're slow or they're lazy. They're just different. Um, it's a different paradigm for us in looking at where we're going. Um, I've put this QR code on here. If you want to look at these slides later and find out how close to Gen Z you are, uh, you know, it's a 15 item quiz. The closer you get to 15, the closer you are to being a Gen Z person. I'm at a six, Marlene's at a seven. I don't know if no, Jen took it. I know. It was a little um, interesting. I think you'll notice a couple of things, even specifically about. Utah Gen Zers that might be different from the nationwide. A couple of things that I do. Because I recognize that challenge that they have working peer to peer immediately in a class, I utilize this collaborations tool. When you go into settings for your Canvas course, you can actually load things in the navigation bar. And one of those options that you can load is a tool called collaborations. If you'll drag that up to, and put it in your navigation bar, essentially what that does is it allows you to start collaboration groups. So I put my students just in random groups or they can select their own. So group one, I assign students to that group and it automatically assigns the instructor. And what that does, it opens up a Google Doc. So they have to share notes, they have to share resources, they have to work together on small projects. But I can assign those groups and then I can see their work and their progress as they work through it. They can give fee peer feedback on documentation, they can load up um, this was particular grouping was for a science class so they had to do a complete owl pellet dissection and label the parts and all the dirty dirty dir things right but they did it in these group collaborations it's low emotional investment and then once they've worked with that group for a while I noticed that over time their interaction in class also much better because they got to start out almost like texting right I'm just gonna phone it in right through this Google Doc and then after a couple of interactions and in the collaboration document then we can say get in your collaboration groups right here in class and they kind of already know it it's like tinder but not okay <laughs> next one uh, this was just an example of their assignments uh, so Sarah has her part and Sammy adds his her part and you know the top three questions just keep scrolling through some of those things um, you can see they submit their methodologies and they I had them do a jigsaw reading uh, I had them submit their jigsaw portions on their bullet points from the jigsaw reading in the collaborations tool and then we talked about it right in class so Rachel Robinson Green uh, 
came back from a trip and she's home dealing with COVID. So she's not here, but we're gonna kind of walk you through a couple of things from her post very quickly, because we wanna leave some time. Academic success programs, this is another link that's very, very helpful as we get going uh, in tailoring to this generation of students and some of the academic success problems or challenges that we have. We stole what your is? picture, Melanie. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Melanie's Any, up there. Can we just um, go? Yeah. Yes. Um, if you want to work with learning specialists, we do have a workshop in May, and so we'd love um, you to join us. Uh, it's it's called Launch. So. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad to know that. You can just keep going. Yeah, okay. Keep talking. Um, this, these are courses from the student academic support courses, USU 1020, 1030, and 1040. If you notice a particular student um, is struggling and really needing some of these tools and resources at a much greater level, these are one credit. I don't think they're seven, oh, they are seven they weekers. Are seven. They're so, on the second seven week, which is nice because you can identify these students yeah. that are struggling and then broker them into these classes. Yeah, great comment. Okay, next slide. Okay. Sorry. Um, sorry, yeah. I teach these classes. We, this year we, we have first and second seven week, so. <laughs> okay, I also want to point out the peer review, another low stakes way. It's really difficult for them to sit across from somebody and review somebody's work face to face and tell them how they can improve. The peer review tool in Canvas, if you've never used it, the instructions are on this page. The peer review tool gives them, I never let it be anonymous so they know who's reviewed their work but again it lowers that emotional distress and they're able to you can just automatically assign it so as soon as somebody turns their paper in it gets assigned to a peer reviewer when the peer reviewer is complete you can have uh, they can have their a separate rubric they can get their points allocated it's very slick very integrated, it's a solid tool. I've used it many times. Happy to answer any questions about that after this session. We kind of went through that at I know. a, a super fast pace. So um, we also have our slides available through the ETE conference um, website. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Um, so if you want to look at, look at our links, look at these assignments we've created, I know that all of us have created a lot of things in Canvas for this purpose. So if you also want to connect and see some of this material that we've already done, and um, I know we're all sharers, we like to share. So anyway, thank you. Thank you.